Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to thank the folks at uh, Curiosis for the invitation uh, and everyone else for joining. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, I don't think who, it was either Eunggyung. Uh, as you heard from the introduction, my lab primarily studies muscle stem cell uh, in the context of aging. And uh, start with the disclosure. Uh, I serve as a member of Curiosis. Uh, I'm a member of Scientific Advisory Board, but I do not have any financial uh, interest with the company. So I'll get that out of the way. And I'll start with our overview of our lab. Uh, our basic mission uh, is to convert the bad aging to good aging. Uh, basically, we're trying to find a way to increase quality of life and health span. And to do this, uh, we combine uh, stem cell biology and different bioengineering approach uh, with the physiological approach to first elucidate the mechanism uh, of aging, uh, especially focusing on skeletal muscle aging. And we try to come up with the therapeutic interventions to slow down the aging process. And ultimately, we want to increase the health span or the quality of life of uh, age individual. So I'll start with a little bit of introduction. Uh, as you know, pretty much everybody knows that our life ex expectancy uh, lifespan has been going up dramatically since the 20th century. So if you look at this graph, uh, it's been going up dramatically. And if you calculate this into an hour, so our life expectancy is increasing 6.5 hours a day. So if you live long and live healthy, this is not going to be a problem, but Aging is also shared with a different age-related disease. So being able to age health uh, without a free of disease and you know living healthy is important. So another statistics uh, that came out recently, uh, in the next 10 years or so, there's going to be a more people over 65 than people under 18. And again, uh, aging is associated with the age-related disease. And obviously, the healthcare costs to treat age-related disease has been growing up uh, dramatically as well. So uh, our lab uh, primarily focuses on sarcopenia. It's aging of the skeletal muscle, a loss of muscle mass, and function that occurs uh, as a function of time. And as you can see from the MRI image, uh, comparing the young individual at 20 uh, years old versus 70-year-old, uh, the light gray area is a muscle. And as you can see, there's a dramatic loss of muscle mass uh, as uh, compared to young individual. But one other thing that I want to mention is that the overall circumference of the muscle, uh, the leg or any type of limb muscle does not change that much. But if you lose muscle mass, uh, that area is actually uh, filled by subcutaneous fat. So overall, if you lose muscle mass, it has a tremendous effect in the uh, overall metabolism of the body. And here's another uh, data that shows the importance of mus maintaining a muscle mass at later age. You could have a different degree of sarcopenia. So uh, x-axis here is in months and the y-axis here is all cause uh, mortality. And the more muscle mass you can maintain at the later stage of your life, the chances of you getting age-related disease or uh, you know even death uh, is significantly decreased. So maintaining a muscle mass is very important uh, for healthy aging or expanding your health span. So what are the causes of age-related uh, muscle mass loss and function? And there are more than 300 different hypotheses uh, to explain aging. Uh, but if you uh, look at all those hypotheses, it boils down to this 12 hallmarks of aging uh, that was recently published in Cell. So mitochondrial dysfunction, about 90% of the ATP energy is generated from the mitochondria. So obviously the mitochondria plays an important role. And cellular senescence, ability to divide our cells uh, properly, uh, decrease with age, and stem cell exhaustion and alter cell-cell communication chromatin, uh, infl uh, chronic inflammation, and epigenetic aberration, or the chromatin uh, changes, and microbiome, genomic instability, telomere, uh, loss of protein homeostasis, and uh, inability to remove damaged organelles, and inability to uh, sense nutrients. Uh, that these all combination of will cause aging uh, process in our body. And 
skeletal muscle to a certain degree uh, is the same way. As we lose muscle mass, um, you know, there are significant changes that occur within the muscle as well. And there is a resident stem cell called satellite cell that replaces the damaged muscle. And with age, uh, there is a significant decrease in the stem cell function. And also uh, cellular communication within the muscle. There is a constant uh, interaction between muscle. And in order for muscle to contract, you need a electrical signaling from the motor neuron to fire an action potential. And this allows muscle to contract. But as we age, this communication between central nervous system and peripheral nervous system to the muscle is disconnected. And that also uh, lead to a muscle atrophy uh, and dysfunction. And also muscle has a unique uh, network of mitochondria within the muscle. And this mitochondrial dysfunction is also known to cause age-related uh, muscle function, uh, uh, decline in age-related uh, age muscle function. And finally, uh, the muscle uh, without water, about 70 to 80% of the muscle mass uh, is composed of proteins, uh, contractor proteins and structural proteins. But as we age, there's an increase in protein degradation within the muscle and there's a decrease in protein synthesis. So the unbalance between degradation and synthesis will lead to uh, loss of muscle mass. And there are also other hormones and other senescence of the muscle stem cells and other uh, factors but th these four areas of research is our main focus. But today, uh, we're just going to uh, focus on how the muscle stem cell will change and how using a live cell imaging is helping us understand the process of aging in the muscle stem cell. So to give you a background on muscle stem cell, I'm sure all of you saw these kind of uh, cartoons in your textbook. Muscle skeletal muscles are composed of myofibers uh, or fiber bundles. And if you look at the single cell of the muscle, it's called muscle fiber. And one of the unique thing about muscle fiber is that it's multinucleated and it's post mitotic. So once the muscle fibers of form, you're not going to divide anymore. And unlike other cells, uh, you have multiple nuclei within a single muscle fiber or a single cell. And as you uh, grow, the muscle size could grow or shrink uh, and depending on the situation and the environment. And we have this muscle stem cell. Uh, these are unipotent stem cell. So uh, these will only make muscle they will eventually undergo a myogenic process. So if there is an injury to the muscle and, or if they, there is a cue to grow the muscle, this will enter the cell cycle and proliferate and fuse to form the uh, multinucleated myotubes. And these myotubes will fuse to the existing muscle fiber to add more nuclei that are derived from the muscle stem cell. So if you look at a cross-sectional view, uh, the lamina stains the periphery of the muscle. These uh, muscle stem cells are actually on the outside of the muscle fiber. And when there is a micro tear to the muscle, and this will get activated. So normally, uh, normal physiological state, uh, these satellite cells are uh, usually seen in the quiescence uh, and not entering the cell cycle. So... Uh, during development, there's a set of transcriptional factor that will form our muscle that we have. Again, these are most uh, post-mitotic. So the muscle fibers that are formed during the development, you're going to have this for decades, 20, 30 years, unless you have an injury to the muscle. Uh, but during uh, adulthood, uh, if there is an injury to the muscle, uh, these muscle stem cells, again, will get activated, but they will reintroduce the same set of genes uh, that used during the development. So they undergo uh, myogenesis. Uh, we call it an adult myogenesis to repair the muscle damage. So uh, again, they're in the quiescence. So the picture you see on the right uh, is a mouse muscle that are injured on the surface of the muscle. So we took the mouse, uh, TBLS anterior muscle, put a piece of dry ice, so the surface of the muscles were injured. Then we took the cross sections. So as you can see, early in the time point of the injury, the nuclei are actually in the center, whereas a normal non-damaged muscle nuclei in the periphery. So what happens is that the stem cell within this muscle will get activated, 
undergoes this myogenic process, forming a myoblast and myotube, and fusing. Uh, when they fuse, they start from the middle. So that's why you have a nuclei in the center. So nuclei that are in the center all come from the stem cell. So in order to repair the damaged muscle, uh, muscle stem cells are indispensable. If you don't have a D these muscle stem cell, you're not going to be able to uh, repair the muscle. And also, uh, when you are one of these guys and when you uh, exercise, uh, well, you don't need to exercise all the time. But you, I'm sure everyone felt that if you do some exercise that you're not used to, the next day your muscles are pretty sore, right? So what happens is that the muscle stem cell, uh, when you're exercising, there's a micro tear uh, to your muscle. And these will in turn will activate your muscle stem cell. And will undergo this myogenic process and fuse the nuclei. But if you're like one of these guys uh, and exercise a lot, so if you do more of an exercise, then your muscles are not sore, right? So your stem cells are actually uh, get the epigenetic memory of those exercises and add more nuclei to the existing muscle. And your muscle respond by uh, and making more proteins, uh, contractile proteins, and your muscle respond by uh, hypertrophy. So mus for muscle homeostasis, growth, and repair, uh, it, you know, muscle stem cells are absolutely needed. But what happens in the aging? So we use mouse model to study uh, aging. And we use 57 black six mice, which has a mean lifespan about 30 and the maximum lifespan about 40 months. And if you compare the two month old to 24 month old, you lose about 50% of your total muscle stem cell number. So 24 month uh, is about 60 to 70 year old in human. And there's a significant decrease in muscle stem cell number. And not only that, uh, whatever that's left at this age at 24, their ability to form a new muscle fiber significantly declines as well. So as a result, uh, there's a significant decline in muscle regeneration. So as you can see, so again, you're looking at the cryo, uh, cryo injured muscle uh, at three months of age in a young muscle. So if you injure the young muscle, about seven days later, uh, pretty much every muscle fiber regenerate as marked by the centrally nuclei. So there's multiple nuclei in the center. Uh, with the, with these nuclei uh, comes from the satellite cells and repair the damage. But if you do the same injury uh, to the 24-month-old muscle, which is equivalent to 60 to 70-year-old, uh, as you can see, even though we did the same injury, there is a significant uh, deficit in ability to regenerate the muscle. Uh, some fibers are necrotic, and there's a lot of infiltration of the immune cells uh, that uh, hinders the regeneration process. And as a result, you get a much delayed response in regeneration, or some muscle fibers will not regenerate and they will become fibrotic. So as we age, uh, there's a significant deficit in the regeneration. So ultimately, uh, our goal uh, is to how do we enhance our ability to regenerate at later stage in our life? So that's uh, our ultimate goal. And in order to study this, uh, in vitro experiments are very important. So the muscle stem cell, uh, again, will form activated to a myoblast and myoblast will fuse and fuse uh, fused my, uh, myotubes will repair the muscle damage. So in order to understand this process, we use both in vitro and in vivo model. But today we're gonna talk about most of the in vitro model uh, and how we study the muscle stem cell. And there's a different way we could isolate muscle stem cell. And most common way is to use a uh, fax fluorescence assisted cell sorting process. So we could take a piece of muscle both from human or animals and we could make mechanically digest and go through the process and we could isolate a pure population of the muscle stem cell or other uh, stem cell within the muscle. And the markers that we use to sort out the pure population uh, is CD45, CD11, uh, CD31, and SCA1. We use it as a negative marker, a SCA1 uh, positive uh, 
cells are actually fibrogenic, adipogenic progenitors, which is like a, a resident MSCs in the muscle. But for muscle stem cell, the positive marker we use are CXCF4 and beta-1 integrin in our lab, uh, originally developed by Amy Wagers at Harvard University. And other labs have identified CD34 positive and alpha-7 integrin positive uh, and lineage negative, like same negative markers as uh, satellite cell population and beta one uh, uh, VCAM1 as a positive marker. But all of this, mark it doesn't matter what markers you use, they will get at least close to 100% um, a pure population of the satellite cells. And we take these cells and we could use uh, look at the myogenesis in vitro. So again, these stem cells will go through this myogenic process in order to repair the damage. And if you have a pure population of the satellite cells, you can look at it in vitro, or you could even transplant into the animals and look at the population, uh, how they repair uh, in vivo as well. But in vitro experiment, as you all know, uh, in order to do a mechanistic study, we have to have an understanding of how these cells, and let's say you want to try to uh, screen for drug that enhances regeneration, you have to ha have to do the study in vitro. So if you culture the cells, a pure population of uh, muscle stem cell, they will undergo my uh, myogenic uh, myogenesis and form a myoblast. And eventually, if you reduce the serum to 2%, they start forming uh, these multinucleated myotubes. So what you see in vivo, you could actually recapture this in an in vitro system. And traditionally, a lot of this research over time uh, has done using this fluorescence image or phase contrast image at a different time point. But there is an issue uh, with just looking at this you know, snapshot of this process. So obviously there is an endpoint uh, experiment and a kinetic experiment. And let's say, you know, we want to look at the viability of the cells. I mean, look, you could use certain drugs and look at the viability at certain time point. But by looking at the snapshot of it, you can miss a lot of, uh, a lot of the, you know, processes that are happening during this process. Uh, so if you do a live cell imaging, a kinetic image uh, using, uh, this was done, the image was done using a curiosis, uh, you know, Celigo Mini Plus. Uh, and because the Celigo Mini Plus has the fluorescence capability, and you can look at the viability and at exact time point uh, when the cells start dying. So when the cells die, especially the adherent cells, will detach from the bottom. And as you can see from the phase contrast, you can see the dark cells that are dying, but you could exactly quantify at which time point spatial temporally, uh, identify the cells that are dying over time. And there's a different software you could quantify this. So cellular response are dynamic process. And if you're doing a drug screening, or if you wanna look at how you know, different uh, experimental treatment is doing uh, is affecting the cell. Doing it in a real time in a kinetic experiment will be more uh, will be more beneficial than just looking at the snapshot. So, analogy I would like to use is that let's say uh, you want to learn how to you know play football, American football, and the analogy that uh, I heard uh, is not from me. I heard from somewhere else is try if you want to look uh, learn how to play football. Uh, you have to look at it in a video. You can't look at it in a book, try to and understand the dynamic process. As you can see from the video, there's 11 guys in offense and 11 guys on the defense going in the same uh, different direction. And there's a different place. Uh, so there's a lot of things going on, dynamic process that are uh, ongoing. And for example, if you're trying to do a wound healing assay, and if you look at the different cell type, HeLa cells, L929 cells, and different cells, even though they're doing the same assay, uh, the time it takes to heal the damage scratch assay uh, that typically people do are going to be different. Sometimes cells will die, uh, and sometimes cells will not die. And there's a different kinetics of how the wound healing process occurs in a different cell type and a different condition. So in these cases, doing in a dynamic kinetic assay is more important than just looking at the snapshot because you could miss, miss out on a lot of the process. So uh, traditionally, the live cell imaging is done. Uh, you grow the cells in culture, and you take that cell plate uh, into a microscope that has a stage uh, with the live cell imaging capability. 
but this is a labor intensive uh intensive um and you can make an error you could drop the plate or you know you could shake the plate that potentially uh produce a confounding variable and it's really difficult to find the same position uh as you know when you put it in a microscope trying to find the same position is going to be very difficult so it's an unstable environment just taking out of the incubator will affect the cell to a certain degree and there's also a risk for contamination uh but the curiosity system is automated uh for live cell imaging so a lot of the cell agro uh system is labor saving. So we put the cells, isolate the cells, uh, put them in the incubator, and we can watch it over time and walk away and look at it. So it's you get a consistent experimental result and it captures image at the same position and you can stitch it. I mean, we're gonna talk about it a little bit later. And we could continuously monitor how the cells, for example, in our case, we look at the muscle stem cell and how they undergo myogenesis. And we could do a, a different drug and look at it over time in the traditional 96 well, 24 well format uh, to look at how cells change over time in a stable environment. And there's a very little uh, risk for contamination. So there are different systems that are out there, uh, but the reason that we uh, use Celego device uh, is that um, it's a, compatible uh, with the traditionally used uh, cell culture uh, vessels. Uh, and it's really easy to use. Uh, it's a user-friendly uh, system. And there's two different systems. So there are different uh, devices. The one that we're using is a Celego Mini Plus. And as you can see uh, from the image, more of the uh, products that are out there are actually played the whole system whole plate is actually moving uh, and as you can see from this video you can see the the media actually shaking or change uh, so this might affect uh, imaging artifact or it might affect the cells but the celego system one of the advantage of the celego system is that instead of the plate uh moving around the camera system actually moves around and scans the cells on the bottom uh without um disturbing the cell uh, uh, environment. So you get more of uh, stable images using the Celego, uh, more of an advanced Celego system, Celego Mini and Celego Pro. So this is something that uh, helped us a lot. And there's also autofocusing uh, capability. So after you take the image, obviously there's going to be some out of, uh, out of focus images but there's an auto-focusing that will uh, automatically focus uh, so that you don't have to come and try to focus it again. And some of the out-of-focus uh, images can be used, uh, we could use a Z-Stack to uh, collapse the image. Uh, so the auto-focus, uh, kind of like a, a digital um, um, opto uh, uh, modification to get rid of the out-of-focus images. So this been helping. Uh, this system has helped a lot understand the myogenic process and some of the feature, other features, especially the confluency. So you see the cells, and you can compare the how long it takes to be confluent. So sometimes the muscle stem cells, uh, when they be proliferate, they have to reach the confluency in order to fuse to form a myotube, and we could. Uh, quantify the time that it takes to uh, become confluent. And Celego uh, Mini Plus and Celego Pro has a fluorescence capability. I, I believe the Mini Plus has the one fluorescence and the Pro has two fluorescence. And we can look at the quantify the fluorescence intensity. And also there's a stacking uh, capability. So if you take a, with the low uh, object, low magnification objective lens, uh, we could actually stitch uh, the images to understand, to get a big bigger field of view. And again, there's a stacking, uh, Z stacking capability that gets rid of the out of focus region and projection, we could generate a projection. And in the pro system, actually we could quantify uh, the, the number of cells and the fluorescence intensity in the region of interest. 
So uh, this has helped a lot. Uh, and we primarily use a mini plus system uh, for our myogenic assays. And here are some examples of comparing the young muscle stem cells that are fused. So this was taken every 20 minutes uh, per cycle for three days. So we can look at the proliferation to uh, differentiation and compare the young and age at our eight month and a 24 month and look at the confluency. So these were looking at uh, comparing the 24 month old uh, from a primary myoblast, not the muscle stem cell. So we started from here to differentiation. Uh, but the pro system uh, also has two, uh, the, one of the advantage, uh, we haven't got the pro system yet, but uh, we will uh, in the near future. The, one of the advantages of the pro system has you could interchange uh, the objective. So if you want to have want to look at the smaller um, organelles, uh, you could use a higher objective um, to look at the structure, and you could look at the Z stack over uh, time. And one of the advantages of using the pro system is that it has a two fluorescence uh, available. So we could put the young cells uh, in GRP and the old cells in TD tomato, M cherry, or the red fluorescence protein. And over time, does the young cells proliferate and fuse faster than the older cells? Uh, and the answer is yes. And we could look at this in the, in the real time in a live cell uh, state. And we could also screen for drug. Uh, we have a compound called Profuse that enhances the fusion and maybe uh, a disease model like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we could compare the fluorescence uh, and how fast and how efficiently they fuse uh, using the system. So we're continuing doing this experiment, and these are not a uh, curiosa system, but one other uh, live cell imaging system we use is a label-free uh, 3D uh, holotomography imaging. Uh, so we could also compare the young and age uh, using the system. And advantage of this system is that you don't have to label anything. Um, and it does have a fluorescence capability, but it's a little bit more. It uses a reflective index uh, imaging as compared to phase contrast. Um, so it's a little bit more, uh, I guess, more in detail. And you can look at the structure a little bit better using the system. So what we do in the lab, uh, we screen or drugs uh, using a curiosa system. And if you want to look at this sp uh, specific structure, we will use this system. Uh, so uh, this curiosa system, uh, again, has been a workhorse in our lab to understand our uh, myogenesis a little bit better. And again, the picture on your left is a fluorescence image. And we're interested in how the metabolism or the mitochondria functions uh, during myogenesis. So picture, obviously, the video on the right is the live cell imaging. And there's mitochondria with a different size and shape. And these actually change uh, during a myogenic process. And as you can see, when the cells divide, when they're undergoing mitosis, and you can actually see the mitosis going on, and they actually, the cells actually shrink. Uh, and, and the mitochondria actually uh, undergo fission uh, to uh, divide the cells between two cells. And by looking at live cell imaging, along with the fluorescence image at a snapshot, we could have an understanding a little bit better. And the, when the myoblasts are about to fuse, instead of making a short mitochondria, they make long mitochondria. And as you can see, the cells move around. Uh, the white part is actually mitochondria. And there's also other uh, cellular structure like the lipid vacuole. And you can actually see the nucleus uh, turning, uh, shaping, and it's actually adherent cells attached to the bottom. And you can see all of this process that you miss out on the still images. And this is very interesting. When they form a myotube, there is a selective fusion process. So as you can see in this myotube, you have multiple nuclei. And this myoblast try to fuse with this uh, myotube, but gets rejected. And then he tries again to fuse with this. And obviously the cellular structure is different between two cells. So this myoblasts are pretty, you know, most likely damaged. And they, they try very hard to fuse but they can't fuse because they get rejected. And eventually these cells will undergo uh, apoptosis. 
So there are like dynamic process that are occurring uh, in this uh, biogenic process. But if you just use this still shot images, sometimes you miss out on some of the processes. And so there are a lot of uh, missing uh, component if you just rely on um, snapshot of this dynamic process. So what you want to do is you have you need to have ability to understand the dynamic process of uh, cellular uh, processes. And the last part, I want to introduce uh, what's called the heterochronic parabiosis. One of the models that we use is called parabiosis, where we could attach young mouse uh, to a young mouse to an old mice uh, to a surgical uh, intervention. So they share the circulation. And this surgical process has been you know, done over a hundred years. Uh, and very quickly, uh, within the seven days, uh, there is this, you know, hemorrhism of the blood that could occur very quickly within the mice. But what's interesting is that if you paired, um, I mentioned uh, in the earlier in the introduction that old mice can't regenerate. So if you just focus on the pink fibers on the bottom, if you pair the young mouse together, uh, you start seeing the pink fiber, uh, meaning it's embryonic mice and heavy chain. It's a marker for regenerating fiber. So obviously it regenerates. But if you pair the old mice together, uh, you don't see a regeneration as I mentioned previously, but surprisingly, if you put the young mouse with the old mice, you start restoring this regenerative capacity, meaning that there is a factor in the young blood that could allow the old muscles to uh, rejuvenate or you know restore the regenerative capacity. So there's been a lot of research uh, that has been done. The previous slide uh, was done nearly 20 years ago by Tom Randall's lab and Arvind Weissman, uh, Weissman's lab at Stanford. And a lot of research uh, was done and we were able to reproduce a lot of the, uh, uh, this parabiosis effect uh, in muscles. But some of the markers of aging like DNA damage uh, and myogenesis could be rejuvenated uh, by heterochronic parabiosis. I'm at the cell cell uh, alteration in the interaction, like neuromuscular junction formation could be rejuvenated. And not only in muscle, uh, there are other organs like heart, brain, uh, liver, pancreas, could all can be to a certain degree can be rejuvenated by when they're exposed to young systemic blood. So the million dollar question has been, uh, what is that rejuvenating factor that's in the young blood that are missing in the old blood? But obviously the biggest drawback of the parabiosis is that you can't do, it's not clinically relevant. Uh, you can't put human beings together. I mean, you could try to do uh, blood trans transfusion, but there's a major difference between blood transfusion and parabiosis. In parabiosis, you're not only sharing blood, you're also sharing an organ uh, between two systems. So for example, bone marrow will constantly make new blood uh, and there are faster, especially in the young, a bone marrow will make blood much faster than the old. So if you do a trans uh, transfusion of the blood, uh, you're missing out on the, some of the or, uh, hormones and other uh, factors that are in the blood as well. So in order to get around this problem, uh, we started using organ on a chip system where it, it is an in vitro system, but it mimics the human organ a little bit more close uh, to the in vivo state. And we can look at this uh, changes in our system. Uh, I like to call this uh, a 3D microphysiological system or the functional unit of the in vivo system. So it's going to be very difficult to mimic everything that are occurring in vivo in the organ or the tissue, like the organoid. Uh, but we will, uh, if you design in the right way, uh, and if you're trying to look at the certain function, we could actually recapture those uh, features in the in vitro system. So um, Initially, it was called the organ on a chip or the body on a chip in a microfluidic device. But the terminology people start to use uh, is a 3D microphysiological system. So uh, in this system, we could evaluate uh, uh, clinical therapeutic drugs. Uh, you could do the toxicity or the viability staining, or uh, you could do the disease modeling. Uh, and the, but the important part is we could do this in a real time and we could do it in a live cell imaging uh, aspect. So initially, uh, obviously we were interested in the muscle and the micro environment of the muscle stem cell. So we were trying to make a vascularized tissue uh, to mimic the microvasculature of the muscle stem cell and the muscle. So we 
took this, uh, used PDMS uh, to measure, uh, to make, uh, fabricate a micro tissue in a system. So we made this microfluidics device uh, with the cells on the bottom. I, th I think if you look at it in the next slide, uh, it'll be better. So we isolated a pure population through the, uh, of the muscle stem cell through fax and took the cells and put this in a microfluidics device uh, to mimic the microenvironment or the anatomy of the muscle stem cell. And we monitored it over time. Uh, you know, we could do this for uh, two weeks or even longer and look at the myogenesis. And we could also identify the secretome, uh, the factors that are releasing uh, from these cells and compare it with the animal blood uh, to mimic uh, heterochronic parabiosis. And we identify certain factors uh, using the system. And if you put this in the young cells, uh, young uh, muscle stem cells and young uh, tissue, you can mimic the young tissue and take, you know, similarly, we could take the old cells and put them in this microfluidic device and connect the system together. We can mimic uh, separately uh, and compare the young and old. And we could just let the blood uh, uh, circulate within the system or we could combine the factor that are coming from the young tissue and combine that with the what's in the circulation uh, or, or mix and match uh, the system to mimic the heterochronic parabiosis in the in vitro system. So we use the system to identify where well, first uh, we have validated whether we're seeing the same thing and whether you're doing a blood transfusion, uh, mimetics or parabiosis, we were able to see the formation of the muscle fibers, muscle myotubes were significantly elevated. Uh, so uh, proof of principle, we were able to um, test it. And we were able to find a VEGF, like I showed in the previous slide, uh, that are similarly found in the animal in vivo heterochronic parabiosis. But there were a lot of issue uh, with this microfluidics device. Um, you know, there was some chip to chip variants, and it was really hard to reproduce everything that are ongoing in uh, in the in vivo system. So we wanted to upgrade our chip system uh, using a better or you know more reliable system, and. It's not just a vasculature uh, that are surrounding the uh, muscle stem cell. There are also neuromuscular junction, and there's also extracellular matrix and other cell type that's within the muscle. It might look a little bit uh, complicated, but the way we designed it, uh, it's in the center. The myotubes are actually seated on the bottom, and we took a pure population of the muscle steps on top. And the extracellular matrix, uh, we try to mimic with the hydrogel. And there's also uh, fibrogenic, adipogenic progenitor cells in the middle. And there's a porous membrane on the top. And on the upper channel, we have endothelial cells that mimics the microvasculature. And on the side channel, uh, we put the motor neuron culture and they will protrude, the axon will protrude and form a neuromuscular junction. So we use this system and with the help of uh, uh, Dr. Yoon, the CEO of Curiosis and Dr. Shin at Curiosis, we redesigned uh, to our own uh, liking. So we made this in the 24 well format uh, with the trans well that will put the endothelial cells on the top. And the, on the side channel, uh, we have a motor neuron uh, that's protruding and forming a neuromuscular junction. So uh, we're using this system and we could combine this chip uh, within the Celigo Pro uh, with the adapter and monitor exactly how cells are dying. And we could put uh, different uh, blood or serum or plasma uh, in the system and identify a specific factor that's in the blood uh, that are allowing the cells to grow faster or slower uh, using the live cell imaging. So these studies are currently ongoing and hopefully we'll have some ideas on what are the rejuvenating factors. Uh, so another important uh, device that we're using uh, with the help of Curiosis is a cell uh, purity system. So this allows to separate plasma, red blood cell, and white blood cells, or even concentrate uh, the cellular component in the blood without the use of centrifugation. So uh, there's also a pros and cons of using centrifuge, but if you just put the blood, whether it's a human blood or the mouse blood, uh, this device will go through this microfluidics uh, device and allow us to uh, concentrate a plasma that are going into our uh, parabiosis in the chip system. So we could take this plasma, 
do a proteal mix to identify the proteins, uh, or we could use this in the chip system in the real time to understand um, what is the rejuvenating factor. So not only muscle, uh, we could use a different organ chip system and even put multi-organ system in the parallel uh, within in the incubator and within our uh, uh, cell growth system to identify the proteins or uh, secretory factors that are rejuvenating the aged tissue. But more importantly, we can't do this human uh, parabiosis in vivo, but if you take and utilize the iPSCs or biopsy from hum uh, human uh, and put them in the system, and we can monitor in real time how uh, human cells are actually rejuvenated. And humans, in a mouse, we're using congenic animal cells, so they're inbred strains. So their genetic background is identical, but problem with human uh, and clinical research is that our genetic background, our age, they're all different. We age at a different rate. So we could do this in a more precision, uh, personalized matter. And what protein, uh, certain protein might work for certain people, what might not work uh, for certain people. So we could do this in a personalized matter. And we could combine with the more of a high throughput single cell sequencing and other things and more advanced uh, proteomics analysis to really, really dig down and understand what is the rejuvenating factor uh, that responsible for muscle regeneration. So with that, uh, this is the most important slide. Uh, so a lot of the in vitro parabiosis study was done. Uh, my former PhD student, Jung Moon, Jennifer Choi, who's currently at Altos Lab, and Yoongi Lee. And some of the hydrogel work was done uh, by Titan. And uh, all other lab members, current lab members, and a former lab members, and our funding source, and our collaborators, uh, especially the, for this project, um, Dr. Yoon has been really instrumental in getting this going. Uh, and some of the, our previous uh, collaborators, uh, Amy Wagers, who is a pioneer in the parabiosis research, and all of our uh, former advisors. So um, there is going to be a webinar survey. So if you don't mind, uh, please go and scan the survey QR co uh, code. Uh, this will uh, lead to the survey. And uh, if you complete the survey, uh, you will be given a Starbucks gift card. Uh, that's what I was, uh, so, so please go ahead uh, and finish this survey and you could get a Starbucks gift card. With that, uh, I'll end my presentation and try to answer any question that are uh, on the chat box.